for today's presentation um, with you all today is to specifically talk about what are the differences in terms of accessibility audits and what to look for in accessibility audit. One of the things you're going to notice in today's webinar is that we're not going to get into a lot of the uh, information about accessibility audits in terms of the technical aspect of them, but I would point you to uh, a webinar we did on April uh, 2019 called What to Expect from an Accessibility Audit, and you can actually ask us for a link to that and we can send you the recording. So if there's some gaps you think need to be filled in after we're done, please go ahead and, and uh, take a look at that recording too. I think you'll find it helpful. So for the agenda today is to describe what key uh, steps should include in pre-consultation phase of an audit. And we're gonna get into talk about that just a little more. It's really a, a valid part of your search when you're looking for partners to help you in accessibility audit. The review of the one size fits all approach and why that doesn't work. Um, for everyone in terms of performing accessibility audits and show examples of how an audit should be formatted. Um, we're going to have a great demonstration. Josh is going to assist me with this in terms of demoing um, results of an audit and, and how do you become more self-sufficient in terms of remediation based on the results of that audit and how do you um, use tools to help you uh, gain better traction in terms of becoming compliant um, and you'll see how that reduces the back and forth during the validation portion of um, bringing your sites or applications into compliance. And last but not least, talk a little bit about the support that's necessary in terms of what happens after that audit's delivered to you. So we're gonna jump right into the pre-consultation before an audit. And this is an area where um, I noticed folks uh, are hesitant to spend a lot of time. And it's really important to understand that the person that is talking to you in terms of trying to support you and understanding the right accessibility audit that's right for you needs some information. And this can be very uh, uh, scary and, and a little different for folks when this is the first time you have approached digital accessibility, it's the first time you've heard about it, and now you've got to make these calls, you've done some Google searches, or you've talked to uh, your peers and you've found out some, some references and, you, and you're making some calls. And it, it is a complicated subject. So you're gonna get some questions that might not be easy to answer, but you should jot them down and have some internal discussions so you can come up with some answers to them. So when you're making decisions, you're making the appropriate decisions. So the driver behind an audit um, influences the audit scope itself. That's the first thing to think of. So when you're having, when you're speaking to somebody in a pre-consultative uh, state in terms of determining what is the, what, what is an audit? What is it gonna cost you? How long does this all take? When you're asking all of those questions that are very important and relevant to you, you have to understand that on the other side of it, some of the questions that are being posed are, how can we help you better? Um, and this is really important. It's something that you should really be looking for when you're, when you're reaching out and having these discussions about an audit. One of the things you'll also find, and I like to point this out, is you'll hear audit and assessment used interchangeably. So um, depending on where vertical you are, sometimes audit are very negative terms and you'll hear assessment, um, but they both point to the same thing. So the first thing to think of from a pre-consult, uh, consultation standpoint is what is the standard you're trying to achieve and it's okay if you don't know exactly or maybe you know that you're trying to achieve WCAG um, standard but now there's 2.0 and 2.1 and which one do you go for the person that you're speaking with when you're having the conversation should have the knowledge to be able to educate you on what the differences are and what it can mean and then you can make that business uh, an informed business decision on your end. Um, and the other thing is basically, what is the driver? So what is the driver of the time um, moving you towards this digital accessibility assessment or audit? And there's, um, there's, you know, could be driven by legal, you're mitigating risk, you're being reactive to um, maybe your vertical or market, you're seeing a lot of legal action there. Um, you're being proactive, you're, you, you haven't maybe, received a, a, a demand letter or received some sort of legal action, 
but you're just being proactive because you want to make sure that when you, if you do, that you receive, that you are ready and prepared. And other drivers are regulatory. Maybe your market you're in has some regulatory uh, uh, guidance in terms of digital accessibility and you, from a regulatory perspective, have to meet those. The other's procurement. You're selling into markets that are demanding that you show your level of compliance because they're on the hook maybe from a regulatory standpoint or they're, um, they understand that they have adopted a certain procurement guideline around third party web or web uh, applications coming into their organizations. They achieve a level, they have a level of compliance before they can go through the, the procurement process. Um, and last but not least, competitive. And that sort of procurement and competitive come hand in hand, right? Being able to market and show that you have, um, you have a, a understanding and um, a policy and a process in place to address digital accessibility definitely will help you in a competitive situation. I had somebody recently ask me, what, what is a competitive situation? Like, what, what could you give me an example? And the example I gave is an RFP. So when they're doing a request for information and they're submitting their product, they will have all the necessary documentation to answer those questions that might be very uh, be, be spelled out in an RFP asking for somebody's level of compliance. And then last but not least, we never want to overlook the fact that it's the right thing to do. Other things to think about when you're, when you're looking for um, you know, a partner to help you with your audits is what is your short-term and long-term goals? And, and what this really comes into play is when you go into um, thinking about your short-term and long-term goals, what is your plan? Where um, basically do you, uh, what is the timing? What is, uh, are you gonna do an update to the site? Are you rewriting the site? Are you getting ready to launch new versions of your application? Um, are they minor? Are they major? Is this, you know, when are your upgrades coming into play? All of these factor into this, and you'll, you'll understand this um, when I get into the slides in just a minute, but this is how your partner that is working with you from a consultative standpoint should be understanding and asking these questions because we want to make sure that um, we are getting the best for our organizations. And when I say we, you as the uh, client want to make sure that you are bringing the proper partner to the table and that you are working internally with your business partners and be able to educate and let them know that the decisions that you're being made are based on a product that might be obsolete within nine months, but you've already put on the drawing board that there's going to be a rewrite of a substantial part of the product so this is why the decisions to go in this direction have been made. And um, so that is really an important factor because we all want to be good stewards of everybody's money, right? Um, this is something that does cost money in order to do an audit of, of, um, of a system or a website. And understanding timing is very important. The other part, and this is very critical, is how do you plan to address the audit results? So. There's one thing to say, I want to get an audit and I want my, my site tested or my web application tested. But once you have those results, what happens? What happens next? And that is critical because that starts getting into more questions. Are you going to be doing this remediation in-house? Are you going to be using an outside vendor? Did an outside vendor write your website? And now you've got to go back and find out what those costs are for remediation. Are you going to choose another vendor because you no longer have a relationship with the with the third party who did it are you looking for um are, are you looking for a third party to to help you with remediation all of these things come into play and then the second part of that is if you do do development in in-house or you have a very uh established relationship with your third party vendor what processes are used in the development so if Agile's in play, what kind of sprints do you have? What kind of, what's your dev load right now versus introducing um, bugs? Do you gonna use a bug tracking system? So the list sort of goes on and on and it's not to be intrusive, it's to be helpful. And last but not least is what is the timeline? So are you up against a timeline or a deadline 
that is because of a legal matter? Is it maybe procurement is driving a timeline because the only way you can get through a procurement is to have a certain document that shows your level of, of compliance? Or is it self-imposed? Um, I see that all the time. A lot of folks are self-imposed deadlines because they've had some meetings internally. They've done some a little bit of research around digital accessibility. They think they've got a good grasp on it. So when they start looking for um, audit or assessment partners, um, they, they've already got a timeline in, in mind, but it can be a little flexible because it is self-imposed. So those are all things to think about um, as you continue and look for, um, except, you know, looking for accessibility uh, audit partners to help you with this. I alluded to this in the agenda, but the one size um, does not fit all. So, the reason why we say that, and you will find that as you learn more and more about digital accessibility, and maybe you've been doing digital accessibility for a while and you're probably sitting there nodding your head because you understand this. So accessibility compliance is a journey. So you wanna make sure that you're choosing a partner that not only understands their business needs, but also understands yours. And we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit, having some flexibility and understanding what your needs and wants are. And, and kind of mirroring the two between what has to happen during an accessibility audit process and how it can support your internal uh, processes and, and expectations and goals. So to keep going on the subject of um, finding the right partner or as well as uh, not all accessibility audits are equal, is the type of audit you choose depends on the scope and motivation. So we kind of talked about some of those motivations and some of those drivers earlier. So now think about when you start defining the scope of the um, accessibility audit is like, think about the fact that um, you might want to just have a base understanding You've seen a lot happen within your space. You've seen news articles, Google word searches have popped up that somebody is now um, in a lawsuit because of digital accessibility and they might be a competitor or they might be somebody within your space that is well known. Um, and you are interested in understanding if your site or if your application is compliant. You might not want to do a full blown audit you might want to just do a baseline there's tons of terms for these but it's really a smaller subset test just to give you a base understanding of where where your site's at um, and that doesn't mean when you remediate against the results that your site is now compliant because it was just a subset of the site just to give you an understanding of where your uh, risk might might lie um, and that's something that is available and is very doable. So partners should be able to do that for you. Um, you know, little uh, or a lot, as much as needed, depending on what you are looking for. The other part is, is making sure your partner can clearly articulate and define their test methodologies. So these do vary depending on the experts in, in this very niche space, um, the methodologies used. Now, they're all, these methodologies were all built against the standards themselves. So there's no right or wrong answer here. It's about consistency, it's about timing, it's about efficiency in terms of how these um, assessment results are produced and delivered to you. So those are all things to keep in mind um, about why all audits are not equal. So I wanna to touch base a little bit here about the types of audits, but I wanna start with the myth behind comprehensive. I hear this used a lot, but we're doing a comprehensive audit or we're doing, we do comprehensive audits and we'll do a, 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 we'll do a full comprehensive audit or we'll do a small comprehensive audit. Just wanna take a minute and talk about comprehensive for a moment. A digital accessibility testing, in order to do it correctly, is comprehensive. So you could do a comprehensive test of a one, one page. And what I mean by that is there's specific methodologies that need to be applied to the standards in order to get a result or a clear result about the level of compliance. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute, but I wanna bring up the fact that comprehensive is a term that's used a lot and really everybody should be doing comprehensive testing. 
and, and that'll make sense here um, in, in just a moment. So I want to make sure that you understand that and understand it's a little bit of an overused term, but it's an appropriate term for the type of testing that's done. But I really think that there's anything you can take away from my portion of this webinar is what comprehensive means and what comprehensive testing is. Um, to go one step further with this, as we, as I pointed out before, the scope determines the audit testing coverage. So again, these are terms you're gonna hear, spot checking, small representative sampling, large representative sampling. It is true, and most in this industry all agree on this, there's no need to test every page of every website or, or any web application. And the reason for that is most web applications or very sophisticated dynamic websites or very large websites or even most websites in general is the level of templating that's used. There are core component libraries that are used in most instances. And there is probably um, more today than ever before the ability to do representative sampling by templates and core components in uh, transaction paths that take place on a site. So that is really representative. Now how big that representative is that you take and include in the scope really drives the, um, the cost of a digital accessibility audit. So kind of touching uh, on the delivery methods, there's also a lot of uh, different ways that information can be disseminated once um, an audit, a digital accessibility audit is performed. Um, there's online reporting. You're gonna see some of that today during our demonstration. The other thing is an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, online reporting can typically be exported to an Excel spreadsheet. Um, Excel spreadsheets, I'm, I'm asked, why would I need a spreadsheet versus the online reporting? Some people say, all I need is an Excel spreadsheet. Why do I need online reporting? I will tell you they go hand in hand. Typically the Excel spreadsheet is used because you'll want to uh, do some groupings in order to uh, put uh, tickets into your bug tracking system. Um, the other is Word documentation and the other is PowerPoint. All of these play a substantial part in a delivery. You don't need all of these documents and every single delivery. It depends on what your goals are. So PowerPoints are typically used to do more drill down targeted um, information to, uh, to developers to help support them and understand um, what they need in terms of um, fixing things if they need to have that big picture um, view of now you've gotten this audit in your hands, now what's gonna happen next. Word documents are typically given when you're doing testing outside the standards, such as uh, screen reader acceptance testing, um, which are gonna, we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Um, and again, the online reporting is usually the master report, but other documents can be produced to support the organization depending on the goals. Very important aspect of any report delivery that's done by uh, around or for audits is to make sure that, um, that you have the information you need either for your internal dev teams that is gonna be doing remediation or external when you've given them access to the reports is to make sure that the partner can provide education and knowledge concerning the issues found. What is the issue? How do you fix it? What was the testing method that was used to detect the issue? What standard does the issue violate? Is it one or more? Um, giving you lots of data to work, uh, uh, to work through the issues um, through your teams but to also give you access to have any, to a human to ask questions to if you have any questions around this. Who's delivering the audit results? Very important. What level of experience and expertise does that person have? Can they answer simple questions? Do they, have, they, have they got the experience necessary to support you and, and walk you through and help you understand complicated, complex issues? Um, what support will your team receive after the audit results are delivered? Um, can you get some assistance creating tickets? Can um, the organization help you have developer specific material? Um, if you're agile and you are trying to write Jared tickets, um, typically this takes a unique set of skills to do the story writing that could um, 
could accompany um, the, the tickets to actually benefit and help the developers understand the effect of what you're asking them to do. Um, and above all, the partner should listen and understand what does your team need to be successful. And that is very, very important aspect of this. I'm going to jump into um, a little bit, getting into a little bit of details about the audit testing itself, because this is um, a very important aspect of, um, of making sure that you have the correct, uh, th that you're doing the testing correctly. And this kind of goes back to that comprehensive statement I talked about. So in order to perform digital accessibility testing, you think about a functional and technical. Think about the technical part of digital accessibility is the standards themselves. So I'm gonna to speak to this as in WCAG uh, criteria. So meeting the criteria of the standards requires, um, well, automated testing and manual testing. So there's a subset of the success criteria that can be tested by using automated testing. And then there's the rest of it um, requires a human tester. And the human tester, is um, actually um, a person that has to go in and, and, and test for that result. So whether it's visual or it's an action, they're doing something to come up with the result of the criteria itself. So you will often hear um, different terms described in this industry. Those of us who have been in this industry for 20 plus years often refer to this type of testing as automated manual. Um, you will also hear people use phrases like human tester or live tester. Um, and those are terms that you hear. And really that is falls under the manual testing um, criteria. That's what you're, you're learning there. The other part of it is the functional testing. So you can meet all the technical requirements, but functional testing is can a person with a disability access the site and use it in the manner it was designed to be used? And that's very important to know because under the technical requirements, if you read the success criteria, there's a subset of uh, success criteria that the only way to obtain a test, uh, I'm sorry, a result from a test is to use assistive technology. Specifically, the criteria calls for the use of a screen reader. Um, it is, W3C is very vendor agnostic. They're never gonna mention um, screen readers by name or vendor, but that is what is necessary in order to obtain a result. So there's a subset of assistive technology testing that's being used during the testing itself of the success, success criteria. But as we've talked about, that's a subset of all this other success criteria. Think about a transaction path on a website or think about a transaction path that, or a user uh, flow that you're asking throughout your, your web applications. That is more functional testing. And that's where you can take um, any assistive technology um, and use that to perform the task and to get greater insight about if the application is allowing a person with a disability that has to use that assistive technology access to that information in the same manner a non-disabled person is, is accessing the information. So that was a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to say, and it's, a, it's, it's hard to put into um, a nice, neat package to kind of talk through that in the, in the way that you test. But I hope that I've done it justice, and, I, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on that and, and when we get into the uh, Q&A session. Now, one of the things that has also grown in this industry over the last 20 years, which I have been a part of it now for 15, um, is the fact that our devices are growing, right? <laughs> I mean, I, when I first entered this, it was all about desktop, right? Web-based applications and websites over desktop. Um, and now we've got smartphones and we've got watches. I mean, now even our appliances are becoming, um, you know, that they're all uh, digital. So now we've got digital interfaces. And this is really a growing um, area in terms of what does digital accessibility cover. When we talked about the functional testing and I talked about the assistive technology testing, that was um, a couple slides ago. Um, just bear in mind that if you were to look up assistive technologies, 
under that definition, there's probably thousands of assistive technologies out there. Um, what we do and most others in this industry do is focus on those assistive technologies that are the most used. So for instance, um, NVDA is certainly becoming very popular for a screen reader, but JAWS is still leading the pack in terms of screen readers. It's just been around longer um, and, has, and, and has been proven, and it is one that um, is still um, up on the, as being the leading screen reader. Um, there are a number of different assistive technologies outside of just screen reader capabilities, and I think it's important to mention Zoom Text and Dragon Naturally Speaking are other assistive technologies. Zoom Text um, is for low vision, and Dragon Naturally Speaking helps. Dragon Naturally Speaking is used by a lot of folks uh, that have cognitive disabilities. So um, they really run the gamut, but these are the two. These, these are the major. Uh, sister technologies that I'd just like to mention, and I certainly am not going to leave off the fact that we have voiceover and talkback now that um, these are on mobile devices. So, um, and obviously, um, Mac users are very used to, uh, uh, you know, having uh, the ability to have the screens talk to them as well because Apple was very forward thinking in terms of their embedding um, for persons with disabilities in terms of um, ATs within the device itself. One more um, little antidote I want to add to the accessibility testing itself, and this is something that comes up a lot, is people will um, want to come up with some um, unique assistive technology and browser pairing. So I thought this was important to note um, because this is something that is quite asked quite often. So, it is important to understand that when you're using assistive technology testing, that these assistive technology vendors um, have tested and have supported browsers they use with their ATs. So we typically will recommend and go with that because that is the supported browser AT combination. Um, if we start using browsers outside of what that um, assistive technology is saying that they support. We certainly are open to do that, but what we have found and what is proven is we find um, a lot of bugs. And it's not bugs within your program, it's bugs between the screen reader and the browsers because that is why the screen reader vendors have published their supported browsers. And they also, many of them will support issues known with other browsers because it's bugs that have been reported. So I just want to leave it at that. I don't want to get into too technical discussion with that, but that is something that um, we hear a lot because obviously as um, a lot of uh, digital accessibility uh, developers, of course, in part of their QA is to test their digital assets against many different browsers. But the reason why in digital accessibility uh, testing and audits that we do this is for that very reason we choose the browser AT combination. So with that said, I've shared a lot of information with you, and I would really like to get into showing you some of the reports and giving you some idea of, um, you know, what do you do with the results, what support is available to you to support accessibility during remediation, and specifically what tools can help your developers um, be more efficient in terms of their remediation efforts and being self-contained in terms of they can check their own work before they ask for it to be looked at again. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn the presentation over to Josh McCoy. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate your uh, presentation, Tammy. All right. So I am sharing my screen. We're going to jump right into the assessment results. Uh, so uh, DQ has a web portal which allows us to deliver the assessment results uh, targeted at a specific um, uh, you know, portion of the test or a uh, you know, specific uh, um, combination of accessible, uh, accessible uh, technologies. All right, so we're gonna look at these results uh, kind of from the top down and then we'll get a sense of what developer tools you can use to also resolve the issues that are presented in this report. Now, 
starting off, I'm on, I'm on an overview page that gives me the high level overview uh, of, of a particular audit that was performed. Now, we get a lot of information from these charts, but starting from left to right, we have the accessibility conformance uh, um, uh, half chart, which basically tells us how many passes and ha how many fails do we have uh, for the test methodology used. Uh, in this particular case, we used uh, the 2.1 AA, WCAG 2.1 AA standards. Uh, so um, we found that 11.3% uh, uh, of the guidelines are failing. So um, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a good high level indicator of, of the health of the project. Now, we also have the user impact, which tells us uh, of the issues that are found, uh, what are the breakdowns? So we've got blocker, critic, uh, critical, major, moderate, and minor. So it basically tells us the number of issues per the severity, right? So each of these are clickable. Uh, we can click and drill down to the tabular data uh, and see what, what those issues are that make up the uh, column reported. Now we'll, get, we'll get back into that tabular view in just a minute, but uh, just know that these charts are clickable. Now, we have one other chart here that is really important and uh, can help us kind of solve some, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, development uh, processes or, um, you know, help us increase the uh, accessibility of our applications and digital assets coming out of development. All right, so the top issues visualization, this shows us uh, of the issues reported, what category or what type of issue do they fall into? All right, so we've got programmatic labels, keyboard navigation, alternative text, so on and so forth. Uh, so we see here there are 12 programmatic uh, label issues, right? Um, this could be a really helpful chart in helping me as a, a let's say a product manager or a team lead uh, or a dev lead, you know, finding and understanding what is it me and my team are doing uh, that we can improve on. So it seems that we've got a lot of these duplicated issues. Uh, you know, possibly they're duplicated on the same component or the same uh, type of components. And so maybe just a little bit of targeted training could help our developers understand how to uh, prevent creating issues like that. So really helpful to have this, this uh, understanding and knowledge um, you know, helps you become a bit more, uh, you know, proactive in, in your uh, accessible journey and uh, helps your development team really focus on creating uh, quality, accessible digital content. All right. Now, we've, we've kind of seen that high-level overview. I want to explain the, uh, um, the items or the units that we're actually testing. So with an application, you might have, uh, you know, sidebars and footers and headers and, you know, these global common components uh, throughout the application, right? So what we do is we actually break up uh, and reduce the amount of, of duplicated testing uh, by capturing those global common components. Like I mentioned, the, head bar, uh, the headers, the sidebars and the footers, we call those components. Right, but that could be something like a uh, um, you know a post article, a blog post article, or a product card, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, we also capture these pages, uh, which could be unique page content or unique areas of the page. Now, um, you know these uh, these all together are called test units, right? So we're testing the components and the pages, and they're all test units, right? Every uh, bite-sized piece or, or page uh, piece uh, needs to be tested through the test methodology. All right, so you'll notice that for uh, every uh, test unit identified, we can click down and you know, view issues that are submitted 
for that particular test unit, we can also review the testing methodology that was performed uh, for this test unit. So a lot of great detail that can be explored here, but I'm gonna kind of skimp a little bit on, on this detail. Uh, I wanna keep it a little bit more high level and, and focus on uh, the core value of this reporting tool. All right, so we are gonna start looking now at the uh, tabular format of the data, all right? This is just the raw, uh, you know, row level data uh, that uh, um, shows us all of the issues that were entered for uh, the testing. Okay, so a lot of detail, or a lot of capabilities here with the detailed data. We can filter and focus, uh, maybe find just the manual issues that are uh, major or critical or moderate. Um, so, you know, we're, we're able to kind of filter and focus and get that uh, data as we need it. And then we can export to uh, common uh, formats like CSV, JSON, uh, Excel. So this can be transported into a smart uh, ticketing system of your choice. Um, very, uh, you know, works very well with, uh, with those systems out there. All right, now for a particular issue, um, we have the capability here to, uh, to actually drill down to a particular issue listing. All right, so this issue, uh, let me actually zoom in just a bit here. The, the issue presentation tells us quite a bit of detail. So it tells us what the page is, what the uh, assistive technology used was, uh, any of the environment specifics. Uh, but then it also gives us a, a lot more detail like what checkpoint did this fail on? Now, this checkpoint is the uh, testing methodology in our uh, uh, methodology. We'll, we'll, get a, we'll get into that in just a moment, but uh, um, that is not, it's not specifically the WCAG uh, guidelines. But, um, you know, we've got a lot of information like uh, what is the impact level? And, and uh, you know, we also have screen captures of the particular uh, test unit um, you know, with the, the issue illustrated uh, if needed. Now, all issues are gonna have a description and a recommendation to fix, right? Depending on the particular issue reported, you may have, uh, you know, quite robust uh, directions or steps to remediate that issue. Uh, sometimes it could be very simple. Sometimes it may take a bit more uh, sophisticated problem solving but our experts will uh, provide you, you know, a, a top quality resolution. Uh, and, you know, as Tammy had mentioned earlier, we'll also have experts available to help you resolve that if you find that you're at a stuck point. All right, now changing gears just a little bit here. Uh, you can see over on the left-hand sidebar there are all the issues reported. Um, we can drill through there, uh, you know, and find uh, some other issues or navigate to the next one. Um, and I, I wanna also kind of talk about the testing methodology that we use here. Uh, you'll notice that we have a very robust testing me methodology used. Uh, it is one that we have created over uh, our 20 plus years of experience. Uh, our subject matter experts use this formal uh, uniformed uh, test methodology to perform full coverage uh, tests on uh, you know, the content or the scope of, of the, uh, uh, the tests. So uh, this allows us to test against whatever uh, standards uh, you know, are, are needed or required and gives us a, a very uh, accurate way of, of ensuring that we're not just meeting you know, certain aspects or pieces of the guidelines, but we are actually meeting 100% full compliance uh, for the, the needed guidelines. So we, we can see uh, testing can be done on desktop web, mobile web, native mobile, 
using specific uh, assisted tech or you know maybe different digital experiences like kiosk or uh, PDF. Now when applicable we'll also link back to the uh, guideline uh, links and you know sometimes that's not applicable but uh, uh, you know when when it is it will be there. Okay, now changing gears again here, we're gonna look at the uh, developer's capability to um, you know, perform some testing or use tools uh, and you know, really figure out how to resolve some of these issues. Uh, so with, the, uh, uh, with an audit or an assessment, you, you actually get uh, a number of seats to the a test browser extension, right? So what we're looking at here real quick before we dive in, uh, we are looking at a demo application. This is the site that we performed the test on. And uh, these, this is the website that we used uh, uh, for the assessment results, right? Uh, so now we're gonna look at this from the perspective of, of a developer. And if you're trying to remediate uh, issues on your website, uh, it would be really helpful to have a tool that runs those automated accessibility tests or can help you understand in a deeper way, um, you know, what the issues are, where they are, and how to fix them. All right, so this tool is very easy to use. We open up the browser, uh, browser developer tools on Chrome or Firefox. Uh, we click the analyze button, and then we have those results, which are uh, going to tell us what the issues are, where they are on the page, and how to resolve them. A lot of really uh, easy to use tools like the highlighter. So this will uh, visually indicate the uh, current issue in scope on the page. Uh, it will focus that for us and then help us understand, you know, where it is in the uh, element uh, hierarchy, All right? So we can jump down into the DOM inspector and see that uh, um, you know DOM rendered HTML. All now we can also take these results and export them to CSV, uh, and uh, that would allow us to you know possibly import them into our uh, you know ticketing system or something like that. Right, so we can work with the raw data if we need to. Now, there's one other tool here that the, uh, the browser extension gives us, and it is very beneficial uh, for developers, right? Lot, you know, a lot of capability to save time here. Um, so the, the tool is called Page Insights. It is a part of our browser extension, World Space and Test. Uh, when we navigate over to Page Insights, uh, we have the ability to, uh, you know, do things like list out the uh, uh, the heading levels, right? So we can see what the he the heading level is. Uh, make sure the uh, headers are following the correct semantic uh, markup and uh, hierarchy, and we can also see what their accessible text is very quickly. Uh, allows us to highlight all and make sure that uh, you know everything is correctly uh, coded and and uh, you know is looking good. And we have a lot of other capabilities here, like uh, lists and images and links. Um, you know, just about uh, you know everything we need to really ensure that you know you know we do have the. Uh, uh, correct text on that image or, or form label, uh, but you know also gives us the tool to really ensure that we are validating that it is descriptive text of the image or the form label, right? So it gives us you know just a, a few ways to to enhance or increase the speed and accuracy of our testing uh, as developers in uh, finding and remediating those issues.
All right. So I think we are just about done here with the uh, demonstration. Uh, so Tammy, I will go ahead and share this back with you. Oops. Great, thank you so much, Josh. So in closing, we just wanna make sure that we're kind of pulling it all together, that when you're seeking assistance with your digital accessibility audits or looking for a digital accessibility audit, you leverage a professional with proven testing methodology. We've kind of shared some of our methodologies with you and vendors should be open and honest about their methodologies that uh, they use and how they stay, uh, may allow you to maintain consistency in terms of your remediation efforts. Also make sure that the uh, experience um, and what I always call bench strengths there, it's good to ask about what certifications folks have that are working on your uh, accessibility initiatives. Uh, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals has two different levels of certifications. There should be a high number of certifications in both levels of certification within an organization that's supporting your digital accessibility. Um, initiatives and those that are providing you, providing you with follow through because you just don't want a piece of paper as we've heard many times talk about get a piece of paper and put it in a drawer. The audit doesn't do anything to bring you into compliance unless you have a remediation um, effort going forth to fix the issues that are, that are found and making sure that the vendor can provide you with some efficiencies in terms of tools that can help your developers um, in terms of getting to an accessible uh, a state. So with that said, um, jo Josh, if you don't mind moving to the next slide, we're, we're happy to uh, open it up to questions and I think Laura is gonna pop back on and she can um, ask some questions that might be uh, brought out uh, in the chat. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, great job, Josh. And Tammy, great job as well on the slides. Uh, really, really informative stuff there. So. The first question we have um, is, what level of WCAG compliance um, is sufficient, would you say? WCAG 2.0 uh, level AA is what most people aim for? Yeah, I, I will take that, thank you. So WCAG 2.0 A and AA is inclusive of A, and it was the de facto standard for quite some time. Um, WCAG 2.1 is now um, in effect. Um, the European standards were quick to uh, adopt it. So WCAG 2.0 A and AA are also, uh, you know, the latest of WCAG. Um, it does take time for organizations to uh, change their policies and standards and, and a process to move to a new standard. And that's just not internally at your organization. It's at the regulatory um, side of things. It's at um, you know uh, procurement asking you for specific, maybe they're asking you for a voluntary product accessibility template. You'll notice that many across the US are still using WCAG 2.0 A and AA um, as the, the standard. I believe we'll see over the next 12, 14, 18 months, people starting to transition to 2.1. Um, because it is newer, it's a slower progression. I, we always let people know is if it's your first time doing an accept, digital accessibility initiative and this is a new policy in your organization, then it would be the appropriate time to automatically choose WCAG 2.1 A and AA since that is the latest standard and it will go for a lot longer. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, another question here for you. Um, how do users track what has been fixed against what was presented in the initial audit result? Oh, really, really great question. Um, so most of the time in a digital accessibility audit uh, project, there is post audit support. So um, what you will see is the way that DQ tracks this is you have your initial uh, audit report delivery, and then that report is cloned and as there is uh, validation against your remediation efforts, the report is updated. So you have what is more a clean report based and you also have statistics on where you were in terms of your level of compliance 
uh, before and after. Great, thanks. Another question here for you is, um, what is the average timeline for an audit? What is the average length of time that organizations should expect, um, say, especially if they have to meet a, a, an upcoming deadline? Mm, really, another great question. The timeline is completely relevant to the scope, right? So, um, but I will tell you the average is four to six weeks. If I was to give an average of, of uh, a timeline, it can, I've seen it done in less time and I've seen very large audits take a little more time, but I think four to six weeks is a good baseline. Great, thanks. Um, so say, you know, a company is just getting started with accessibility. We know an audit is a great place to start, but um, if you are regularly doing audits, it can become quite expensive. So when is it a good time for a company to graduate from regular audits to perhaps uh, more sustainable tooling? if their long-term goal is accessibility, that is? The answer to that question is it depends, and I know that's not a great answer, but it depends on is your staff in-house? If your staff is in-house, how much time and effort can you put towards doing uh, training um, and then giving them, um, giving them the tools to help support it? Um, let, me, let me back up and, and, and answer that question in two parts. The first part is, um, definitely get yourself into a compliant state. And when I keep using the term compliant state, I will hear a lot of folks that are new to this come and say, I want to be 100% accessible within a two month, you know, time frame. throwing that out there. 100% um, compliance is only attainable at a point in time, right? Because websites change, web applications change, content changes. So the, to get a conformance statement, it's at a, a point in time. So what I would tell you, there's two options there. Number one, I call it the crawl, walk, run, right? Crawling is get some automated tools like the um, a test web browser into your dev's hands. That will certainly help you have more of an understanding of where you are in your development efforts and, and, and having more accessible uh, code coming out of the development staff. Make sure your QA folks um, are running it. Or there's also managed services where uh, like DQ offers managed services where we uh, do automated and manual testing on, an, on a um, scheduled basis over a year, year period. We also um, offer in-person training as well as online training. So I'm giving you a lot of information because I'm going to go back to my answer of it depends because we need to know where you're at and where you're, uh, uh, if you have internal uh, resources that are supporting your dev efforts. And I think maybe if we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I could give you a more accurate timeline in terms of when to increase your tooling to get more self-sufficient. Great, thanks. Um, so that is the end of the questions. Um, we'll let everybody get back to their days. I wanna thank Tammy again and Josh for doing great demos. Um, if you, know, you have any questions pop up, feel free to email us and we'll be sending out the recording and slides shortly. Thanks everybody, have a great day.